Look at that big smile you've got. On this episode of Bondi Vet. Hello. Oh, I'm so cute. Kate comes to the aid of a puppy with a funny tummy. It just wipes out every unvaccinated dog. Like, it's horrendous. It's oh, horrible. my God. Look, look, look. It's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. You need to sit down. can definitely feel there is a nerve injury or a broken bone. Lisa treats a daredevil kitten that's made one leap too many. There's a good chance that if the break is severe enough that she's going to need surgery. Come on, little fella. I'm dying to know. We got a boy or a girl. And can Chris and Tim solve a case of mistaken identity? We need to know who the mum and dad are. You make my world a better place. <laughs> Come on, there's your girl. I can depend on you. It's a dreary wet day in Sydney. And pet owner Arnika has brought someone to the Bondi Vet Hospital who's feeling under the weather. Hi, how are you? This little one. Uh, that's a little Wolfie. I'm here to see Dr K. OK, no worries. Take a seat. She won't be long. Awesome, thank you. Arnika hopes Dr Kate can tell her what's wrong with her brand new puppy, Wolfie. Yeah, I think we'll be all right. So he's been feeling unwell since yesterday. He's been like throwing up, diarrhea, stopped eating, stopped drinking. And so he's our new baby and yeah, it's yeah, breaking my heart. <laughs> hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How oh, are you? Oh, you have a new puppy. Wolfie. Yeah. Hello. Is it a Wolfie? Hello, little Wolfie. He's feeling really unwell. Oh, that's not very good. Are you going to come in? Be a bit cute. <laughs> come in, come in. My first patient for the day is a little Cocker Spaniel, eight weeks old, called Wolfie. Super cute. He's been um, vomiting and he stopped eating um, and has diarrhea. And when did you get him? On Friday. Okay, so you haven't had him for very long. No, and he was actually fine when we got him. And then yesterday we did change a tiny bit of his food. And when you say a little bit, do you mean that you just added a little bit to his regular? Yeah. So did he, the vomit start first or the diarrhea start first? Diarrhea. Wolfie has had diarrhoea and he's also had a little vomit last night. In a full-grown adult dog, that wouldn't be such a big deal. But Wolfie's only eight weeks. He's really small and like a human baby, things can go wrong really quickly. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm so cute. Hello, Wolfie. Oh, so little. How much do you weigh, little guy? Come on, let's just put you on the scales. There you go. 2.68. Oh, he's tiny. Tiny. You can see straight up that Wolfie isn't feeling that well. He should be running around this little waiting room like nobody's business, but he is pretty quiet today. His respiratory rate is a little bit high. I feel like he's been breathing quite fast in general. Yeah, so particularly when your tummy doesn't feel very good, yeah. is that quite often, you know, your respiratory rate goes up a little. He's just not himself. So he is a little bit hot, so he's 39.2. Yeah, he's been shivering so much. Wolfie has a little bit of a temperature. I don't love that. He has some abdominal discomfort. Coupled with the fact that Annika has talked about Wolfie having this very large tummy. It's a little uncomfortable in there, isn't it? It's normal for little pups to have really big bellies, but when I hear that, the first thing that comes to my head is that there's potentially some kind of a parasite there. So what we're looking for are things like coccidia, for example. Other things can be worms, so things like tapeworm or hookworm. Hanukkah's worst fear is that tiny Wolfie has caught the deadly parvovirus. Parvovirus is a really big deal in dogs. It's super virulent, like it can live on a piece of grass for 18 months. It's not just transmitted by a dog. It's transmitted by the... poop. And so it lives on the grass. Yes. Well. You never get a single case of parvo. So what you're seeing is like an epidemic, right? It comes in, it just wipes out every unvaccinated dog. Like it's horrendous. It's oh horrible. my God. Yeah, I'm just very worried. <laughs> we took him out onto the grass for like five minutes and that's very like horrible. That would be the nightmare because he's so tiny and yeah, I just, I'm just a bit scared. When we see parvovirus, 99% of the time, we've got hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. So in other words, there's like literally just blood pouring out their backside. Okay, cool. Right? Yeah, that wasn't the case. 
Yeah, so definitely still needs to be on the list, but it's saying that it's a lot less likely. Wolfie's symptoms are more suggestive of a parasite or bacterial infection, but the danger to his life still remains. When you're this little, it's like a baby not having eaten. Puppies are a bit like babies, they can go downhill very quickly. Wolfie, can you give me a ride, baby? So this is just some saline. And what this is doing is it's replacing some of his lost fluid, right? So we're hoping here that he doesn't get dehydrated. Generally, when they're not feeling well, it's usually coming from a place of dehydration and the fact that he's not eaten very much. Are you happy holding? Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. He's just gonna squirm a little. Okay, buddy, don't worry. Just feels funny. I think we'll probably do somewhere between about 50 and 60 mils. But as Kate and Nurse Maria rehydrate little Wolfie, Okay, I'm going to take him off you. Whoops, 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 whoops. it's okay, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You need to sit down. Sit down, Mum. Sorry. Sit down. Suddenly, Annika is the one who could need treatment. Maybe it's just a bit hot. Yeah, just on the aircon. Poor Mum put that needle in and I just saw her go white and I knew it even before she said it and she said, oh, I'm not feeling that well. I've had this happen quite a lot of times where people end up on the floor and I thought, I've already got a sick dog here. I definitely don't need Annika on the ground. Okay, glass of water. Amazing, thank you. Thank Sit you. down, don't take your bottom off that chair. <laughs> what she's worried about is him having parvovirus. These guys are really sick. They often won't walk. They're very lethargic, a little bit like Wolfie. It isn't something that we have any treatment for. I can't solve parvovirus. So when they get it, it's just supportive care. And sadly, a lot of them do still die. To look after mum and puppy. As Wolfie's anxious mum starts to feel better, the attention returns to the original patient. It's really important I do get a, a faecal sample from you. I'm going to send you home with a poop pot. So we need to figure out exactly what is going on in Wolfie's gut and what the poop's going to tell us is exactly what is happening in there. All right little buddy. Annika must now closely monitor her precious pup until test results on the poo sample come back. Thank you so much. No worries. <laughs> See you, little guy. Aww. You'll feel better in no time. How do I feel about Wolfie at this point? I feel worried, right? So he would be a dog that I would probably go home at 2am in the morning and think about and think, mm, I hope he's okay. So that's why it's really important in this particular case that she's probably going to get about seven phone calls today because we need to make sure that this is headed in the right direction. See ya. See ya. Yeah, I'm going to look after him, see what happens. I'm so in love with him. How can he not? <laughs> Wolfie! A few days later, Wolfie's health is starting to improve. Tests show he was infected with a parasite which caused the vomiting and diarrhoea. Yeah. With ongoing treatment, he should be a happy, playful puppy again in no time. She's pretty brave, isn't she? She hasn't really made any noise or anything. Little six-month-old Tonkinese kitten Luna has been rushed into the Bondi Referral Hospital sash after a nasty fall at home. See, her paw is a little bit twisted, isn't it? Let's see. The tiny kitten can't put any weight on her front right leg. Luna is beautiful and um, very, very friendly, very, very playful. We've only had her for about three months, but she runs around like crazy. And we think maybe she jumped off the bunk bed then fell badly. It's okay. We're gonna go and get you looked at, hey? Here we go. Hello, I'm Lisa. I'm one of the emergency vets. Hi. This must be little Luna. It is Luna. Alright, come through. Come on, come on. When I first see Luna sitting on Adam's lap, the first thing I can think of is she is so cute. She's a tiny little kitten and I'm worried that she's done something pretty serious. So take a seat, just over here. All right, now what's happened with Luna? Um, she has fallen off something at a high level and she has damaged her right leg, 
the front, the front right leg. Yeah. Is she putting weight on it at all? No. no. As you can see, that one, she moves it. This yep. one, she doesn't move at all. How high was the height that she fell off? Probably about two metres. Two metres. Yeah. It was a balcony or...? No, 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 just a bunk bed. And at the time, did she sort of just start screaming straight away or...? Did she no, she just or... ran for cover. We just sort of on sort of limped for cover. Yeah. yeah. And um, any issues with her consciousness, her breathing? No, no. All right. I would like to see her walking around the room. Often when cats are in pain, they might just sit in a corner and not move. No, she'll, so we'll she'll, just see what she does. She'll try. It's really important that I see how Luna moves. Hey, Luna. Luna. And the first thing I notice is that she seems really uncomfortable. Yeah, you see, she must be ill because she'll chase this pen like crazy yeah. if, she was, if she was well. Yeah, well, she, she knows that it's going to hurt to do it, so she's yeah, just I'm... sitting there guarding herself. It's a real concern that Luna doesn't want to put any weight on that front right leg. What I need to work out is has she damaged the nerve, the muscles or the bone? Because she's a six month old kitten. She should be running around and playing and all she's doing is sitting still with her leg rotated. Something is seriously wrong. Let's pop her up on the table. Up on the table, okay. All right, little girl. I'm just gonna have a look at the rest of you first. I'm really worried about Luna. I need to have a really good look at her. There you go. Nice and gentle. I need to examine her from head to toe because she's fallen from a height and her leg may not be the only problem. Let's have a look, because you're just a baby. And she doesn't seem to have any issues with her jaw, which is good. I mean, that can sometimes happen when they fall from a height. They mm. can fracture their jaw. Mm. She's breathing normally, which is good. Her yeah. lungs sound nice and clear. Yeah. Hey, sweet pea. Thank goodness for Luna. Her checkup is all clear. She's one lucky cat. The next thing I need to do is look at Luna's leg. She's a brave girl, whatever she's done. Yeah. And she does have the ability to pull the leg away. Yeah. I guess that would happen if it if there is a nerve injury or if there's a, a broken bone, for example. Sure. I'm just gonna have a gentle feel over here. Oh, I can definitely feel some crunching here. Yeah, crunching's not a good sound, Yeah, does it? no. Yeah. Something feels really unstable in that shoulder. OK. I'm really worried she's got a broken leg. Even though I'm feeling Luna's leg quite gently, as soon as I get to the upper part of the limb, I can feel some crunching and instability. And to me, that feels like a broken bone. Now, that has got to hurt. First things first is we need to take some x-rays. Sure. Uh, so we need to give her some sedation or an anaesthetic uh, yeah. and take some really good pictures so we can see exactly what she's done. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance that if the break is severe enough that she's going to need surgery. Oh, OK. So you're committed to go ahead if yes. that's what we think she of needs? Of course. OK. I was hoping that she would just have a sprain of some kind. So you don't ever want to think of people break or anything breaking their bones. It's not good. But the nice thing is she's in capable hands. Come on, darling. Oh. Oops. You just didn't want to come out. What the matter? Lisa has called in specialist surgeon Dr Andrew Marchewski huh? to confirm Luna's diagnosis. There's definitely something broken. I better get some x-rays okay. and find out what exactly the fracture is. So I've had a little bit of a feel and there's a bit of crunchiness going on in there. So we've got to see exactly what she's done, but I'm a bit fearful. Right, It'll be a little bit cold. Luna needs to be anaesthetised so she won't feel pain when her injured leg is positioned for the x-rays. Dim the lights. All right. All right. See what she's done. Ouch. That's where the crunching came from. Mm. So she's got that fracture right in the middle of that humerus or arm bone. She's just snapped it in yeah. half. She must have landed on it and just gone. Yeah, well, she's so tiny. She's got tiny little bones. And yeah. as the x ray comes up, we can see straight away that she has got a massive break right through the middle of her humerus. Now that's the bone at the top of her leg and that will cause her a lot of pain and explain exactly why she's not putting any weight on it at all. She's done a good job on herself there. Wow, oh, that is a big break. Yeah. Yeah, right. 
Well, we're definitely going to have to do some surgery. That's not going to heal itself. No, absolutely. We can't put a bent cast on that, so. No, not a chance. Because Luna is already anaesthetised, she will go straight into surgery, which will give her the best chance of a quick recovery. It's going to be really fiddly because it's little bone, lots of muscles, big nerves, and I've got to work in and around all of that, so it's going to be pretty intricate. I think she's going to need her nine lives. All right, we'll see how we go. Right, Luna. Well, let's start. We're going to make a nice long incision to get up this whole bone. Here's a radial nerve, which we to avoid. It's very bruised. It is bruised. There's a fracture scientist there. We're just getting down to we actually see where that break is now. So we'll just have to manipulate these bones a little bit, stretch them out. What tends to happen after you get a fracture is the muscles sort of contract and the, the fracture ends override. So we're going to have to stretch it back out, temporarily clamp it in that position, and then put the plate on. All right, I'll just get a few wires around that now. All right, that's good. Andrew can now start to screw on a supporting plate. Great, that's one. Yeah, we'll just do some drilling now and we'll see how we go. That's good. Screw, and we'll just try and get one up here above. The real risk here is these bones are really fine and, and actually quite brittle. And if we're not very careful, you can actually shatter them. And if that happens, then we're in a real deal of trouble. So we're just going to place this last screw. And we've just got to close the muscle in the skin and we're done. I'm really happy with how the, uh, that fracture came together. There's a little bit of a fiddle just because the bones are so small and so fine. You put your finger just there. All right. So we'll go and take some x-rays to just make sure we've got all the implants in the right spot. Nice. You can see sort of that's where the fracture was. So we've got one, two, three screws below that fracture site. And we've got three nice screws above it. Got to be happy with that. Happy to wake her up? Yeah, sure. Look, it's probably going to take her a good six or eight weeks to heal fully, but she'll feel like she's fixed almost straight away because that plate's really solid and it'll feel like a new leg. We'll just get into her recovery bed now and we'll see how she's going tomorrow. so much happier. My goodness. Little Tonkinese kitten Luna has spent the night at Sash. It's looking good. You're already putting weight on it. Hey, it's looking much better already. Who would have thought that yesterday your leg was snapped in half and now you are rolling around like this? Huh? Who would have thought? Luna's wound is looking really good. The leg is a little bit swollen, which is to be expected after she's had a metal plate put in it, but it doesn't seem to be bothering her. In fact, she is so much better than she was yesterday. She's putting weight on the leg and she seems really comfortable. This little girl is ready to go home. Out in reception, owner Adam and his daughters, Molly and Chloe, can't wait to see their much-loved kitten. It's really great to take Luna home. It'll, uh, it'll complete our family again, because we missed her. Hello. You won't believe your eyes. She's as good as new, except balder. Take her out. Come here, little girl. Oh, She's acting like nothing has happened. When Luna first came in, she wouldn't move. Uh, she didn't even want to play with a pen. Most kittens love that. And now she's had her surgery. She's recovering, but I think we've got one last test. There we go. Now that is what a kitten is supposed to do with a pen. <laughs> Luna, that, that leg has had surgery, <laughs> miss. Here's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even know. <laughs> but I think we will do if she carries on doing that. Oh, not that one. So it's going to be six weeks 
till things start to heal properly. During that time, she's going to really need to be confined. The surgeons did a, an incredible job, considering as well that her arm was hanging um, yesterday and she's got full mobility today. It's incredible. No more jumping off beds. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. You've got a hard job ahead of you, I'm warning you. Luna really does have a beautiful nature. She's affectionate and she's interactive, but the thing that strikes me the most is her bravery. She came in here with her legs snapped in half and now she's out the door as if nothing's happened. How amazing is that? In North London, Scott's answering a call from rescue charity All Dogs Matter. They've given me a call because they're really worried about a Staffordshire Bull Terrier called Rosa. So I need to go up to investigate and I really hope there's something that I can do to help. Hi, Hi. Scott. Hi, Sonia. Animal rescuer Sonia is waiting for Scott. I'm fine, thank now, you. Now here you've got a pretty sad case to, to come and see me today. Yes, you're here to see Rosa. I'd love to see Lovely you. Lovely little Staffy, but oh, good. in quite a bad way. Oh dear. Today, there's a full house of abandoned dogs which need new homes. Wow, you've got lots of dogs in at the moment, haven't you? We have. We've got a few puppies in. Yeah. And then we've got Rosa up here. Hello, Rosa. Hey, Rosa. Hello, beautiful girl. How are you? Rosa was picked up by the dog warden after being found wandering the streets of London. Hello, gorgeous. So yet again, another stray Staffy, hey? Very yeah. over overrepresented breed, aren't they? Unfortunately, it's very common with Staffies. Most of the dogs that come into rescues are Staffies yeah. or Staffy types. I think Staffies get dumped so often in rescue centres because the people that think that's a perfect dog for them are not getting them for all the right reasons. People should want a dog for the companionship, for the love and the affection that the dog gives. But some Staffy owners see them as literally a status symbol. They haven't thought about all the welfare needs that this dog has, and very quickly they realise that they can't keep the dog. They then throw it into a rescue centre and that's where they languish. She's very, very happy. Yeah, although very, very thin. Look at all those yeah. ribs, Rosa, hey? You need some feeding up, don't you, my love? I don't understand people that can dump their dogs. I can't get my head around it at all. Rehome it the proper way. There's people around to help these days. You don't need to abandon your dogs. Hey, look at you. Aren't you just lovely? Oh, lovely stuffy smile. Look at that big smile you've got, hey? She's quite a happy little girl. I'm just hoping that we can get her a perfect family. But first, Scott is giving Rosa a total health check. Apart from being underweight and suffering superficial skin problems, Scott soon discovers a far more worrying issue. There's actually some hard lumps present along the strip of mammary tissue here. Can you, can you feel those? Oh God, yeah, I can really feel really hard lump. Yeah. So basically, she's got lumps in her breast, which uh, you know, for any, any female is, is concerning. Mm. It's not something that we can just quickly remove and go, oh yes, that will be absolutely fine. We need to look into this, understanding Mm -hmm. what kind of lumps they are and whether they'll affect her future. Okay. Scott is guessing that Rosa is about eight years old. It appears she has been used for excessive breeding before being dumped. Overbreeding is fairly common in Staffies, unfortunately. They are bred by unscrupulous breeders. They are bred every single season, so that means every six months these poor dogs can be having yet another litter of puppies. So I think what we're going to have to do is take you to Leafy Richmond, check her over and see how she's going and make sure that she is going to have yeah. her forever home. Oh, thank you. Hey. Rose is going to make a perfect pet for somebody. I love her, really love her. I'd love to take her home myself. Yeah, that's a killer. That's, that's a killer a bike of a dog, is, isn't that? That's a bike kiss. Oh. <laughs> see you soon. So do you want to come back to Richmond with me? Hey, beautiful Leafy Richmond. Hey, or do you want to crawl back to Richmond? I think she does. <laughs> Crawling back to Richmond, it's a bit of a distance. Come this way. Come on, Rosa. Let's go meet the team, shall we? Oh, you're keen. Come here. Scott's arrived back in Richmond with little rescue dog Rosa. Hi, hi Rosa. 
The friendly staffy is an instant hit with receptionist Kirsty. Can <laughs> you see a kiss? Hey. Sit on my lap. <laughs> you're comfortable. Oh, you're lovely, aren't you? She's beautiful. You're so friendly. I know. All right, well, let's get you off Auntie Kirsty's lap, <laughs> eh? And go and check out those lumps. Come on, Rosa. Oh, bye, Rosa. Good girl. <laughs> Scott's concerned about lumps in Rosa's mammary glands and plans to remove one so it can be tested. So this is Rosa. Oh, Hi, yeah. Rosa. Oh, good girl. Oh, oh, oops. Oh, hello. Oh, that's a risky. Of energy, eh? Hi. Yeah. Assisting Scott are head nurse Emma and newly graduated vet Riaz. She is clearly a dog that's been bred a lot. Oh, honey. I definitely feel it on my heartstrings when a neglect case comes in. Having animals myself and being such a big animal lover and doing what I do, I just can't put myself in the mindset of other people and how they could want to harm them. Unfortunately, there's absolutely no history. Um, she was just found roaming around and uh, was brought into the rescue centre. You must have had an owner at some point, surely. Mm. All right, guys, well, I'll leave you to get her ready for surgery and I'll be down in just a second. We'll get cracking. Brilliant. Yeah. Well. Good stuff. This is Riaz's first job out of university and already he's discovering plenty of challenges. I'm not really used to seeing rescue dogs because the way that we've been taught is to always get a good history and take it from there. What a brave girl. But when it's a case like Rosie, you just have to sort of do the best you can and, you know, put the animal's needs first. Time to go to sleep, baby. Good girl. We're good to go. All right. So the big concern for this little lady is these memory masses. And we can feel them running up these chains of teats. And unfortunately, now she's knocked out, I can even feel one at this top one. So to remove all of them yeah. is a massive surgery for her to undergo. And we don't want to put her through that unless we absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. So what I think we need to do is just take just one of them away. And at the same time, we'll then spay her. And what that will do, of course, is reduce the stimulation to the area. The hormonal exactly. stimulation. Yeah, right. and as a result, hopefully cool down the growth of these masses, whatever they turn out to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. The most striking thing that we found was the number of masses. Normally, you might find one or two at a, at a like a, a dog which is that age, which hasn't been spayed. But to find the sort of number that we did, it was quite striking. Everyone ready to go? Okay. All right. So we just need to keep our wits about us. Scott is carrying out the spaying on Rosa first. Actually, her being quite skinny is quite useful, actually. It's quite easy to see what we need to see. The spaying is routine. OK, I'm happy with that. And Scott can now move on to the lump removal. I should be able to remove that fairly easily. And actually, I'm going to do it through the incision line I've already made for the spay. So I'm just going to incise over it now, kind of pop it out like a pea out of a pod. It's very pretty, it's very nice. But now that he can see the lump, Scott is starting to worry that this part of Rosa's surgery isn't going to be as straightforward as he'd hoped. Though it feels like it should just pop out, it's very tightly adhered to the tissue surrounding it. So it's, uh, it's very angry looking, very nodular, very hard. It worries me, I've got to be honest. Uh, it just doesn't look good. All right, Riaz, what I need you to do for me is just pop your two fingers underneath and around it. Put a little bit of pressure against it for me. Something a little bit worrying. I'm not that happy, if I'm honest, because uh, I was really hoping that it would just be a relative innocuous looking hard white ball that was just going to pop out and uh, look very, uh, very innocent. But in fact, what I've found is something that looks quite aggressive. Just nasty. Okay. All right, there we go. So now we've taken this little bit of tissue out and the lump, what we're gonna do is then send it off to the lab. I really don't know what it is right now. It absolutely could be cancer. Oh, that's again. Good girl, well done. So there's sort of two types of tumors. The two types that roses could come back as are either benign or malignant. The benign ones don't really spread and do too much damage unless they get really big. The malignant ones have the ability to spread to other tissues and sort of do damage elsewhere, which could compromise Rose's life. Oh, good puppy. This is normally the time we call an owner, but sadly, you don't have one. 
So I'm just going to have to take on that role for a while, hey? I think while Rosa is here in recovery, she is going to get all the love in the world. The nurses have all fallen in love with her, and already they're dying to go in and give her a cuddle once she's recovered fully. Hey. Oh, baby. I think we're just going to keep Rosa close by until we can understand what's going on and what we need to do to try and save this beautiful dog. Mm -hmm. Poor Bubba. Yeah, I love you too. Uh, yeah, she's very, very flat. The pathology results are back from the suspicious lump that Scott removed from Rose's breast tissue. All right, there we go. And they show that, as feared, it is cancer. You love a good kiss and a cuddle, don't you? Hmm? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Rosa, our beautiful Staffordshire Bull Terrier, is really not doing too well today. She is flat. Emma's been working with her all through the morning. It's not how I was supposed to be, is it? It's not what we talked about. With Rosa deteriorating so quickly from the rapidly spreading cancer cells, Scott has taken new x-rays. Sadly, down the bottom here, there is this. And that looks like to be chest met, um, which is a metastasis, which means that the tumours that are present in her breast tissue have spread to her lungs, which is gutting, because it means that no surgery in the world is going to save Rosa. It makes me so angry that someone knew that this dog had those lumps there and simply did nothing about it, because if they did do something about it, then Rosa's life could have been saved, and that is just awful. Hey, beautiful one. Hey, I met you were a gorgeous little puppy. Mm -hmm. Head nurse Emma and receptionist Kirsty are maintaining a vigil at Rose's side. You've become such a big part of the family. Everyone has just fallen in love with her, haven't they? <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> I feel really devastated, to be quite honest. You know, I've come to get really quite attached to Rosa and, you know, considering adopting her myself, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. Tough decisions will soon have to be made to ensure Rosa doesn't suffer. I think the most important thing that we always have to remember is doing it for her. Yeah, definitely. I don't think this part of the job ever gets any easier. I think it always hurts, and I think the day that it stops, I'm not doing my job right. <laughs> Soon after, Rosa lost her battle. But she leaves a lasting memory. Look at that big smile you've got, hey? Rosa signifies what we all love about dogs, the fact that she gives unconditional love. Oh, good girl. Regardless of her history and what's happened before, she loved us and uh, I hope that we've given her a little window into how normal dogs live, which is where they're loved. Hi, I'm Dr. Danny Dusek. If you love our show and want to see more amazing stories from the Bondi Vet team, just hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you for our next video. It's all the mums and bubs. Okay. At the Australian Reptile Park, General Manager Tim Faulkner has asked Chris for help with three new arrivals. The problem is that they go wandering at night when there's three mums, they go back to the wrong mum. Head in the pouch, drink the milk, oh, this seems like my mum, and that's a problem for us. We manage the genetics of all of our animals at the Reptile Park, and the last thing we want is for the joeys to switch parents, and that could result in an inbreeding in their adult life. We need to know who the mum and dad are. We need to give them microchips so that they can be individually identified. Come on, mate. Come on, little fella. 
The whole idea of a microchip is to provide a permanent form of identification, one that just can't be removed or changed. It's essentially a number, but it's their number for life. Don't you do it. Hey, look, they're about to swap mums. Chris is getting a first-hand demonstration of the truant joeys in action. In the wild, koala mums wouldn't live this close together. And if their joey went missing a few metres away, they would actively find it and get it back. Meg's doing what she thinks is natural. Good mum. And Meg's off after her. <laughs> What's that baby? Hey, hey, hey. The sex of the cheeky joeys hasn't been determined. So that's Chris's first job, along with a full health check. Oh, oh, oh. No, I don't think so. It's not going to happen. Are you going to use that as your tree, are you? You know what that's connected to? My head. Come on. I'm dying yeah. to know. We got a boy or a girl? <laughs> what girl is it? We got a pouch. Yep. Oh, that's great. Most years we have almost always boys. Really? Yeah, sometimes like uh, three males to one female. Joey number one, and it's a little girl, and that's great news. Girls can have more joeys, and the population gets bigger. You're welcome to name her. It just has to start with a J. That's how we keep the family lineage. What about Jerry? You OK with that? You have Jerry Hall. We can have Jerry. Jerry is the first Joey to get her all-important microchip. It's all right. The microchip goes underneath the skin, just between the shoulder blades. It's a very numb part of their body, so the needle doesn't really hurt when it goes in. But most importantly, it's usually an easy place to access with the scanner. So you can always read that number. Stay there for a minute, mate. There you go. One down, two to go. One foot off, they're like fishing hooks, aren't they? Yeah. Yep, she'll go straight on your shirt. It's off. There you go. But Joey number two is giving Chris a feisty reception. Ooh. <laughs> the right hook. Hey. You learn something very quickly with these Joeys. They're packing cute looks and claws like razor blades. Yeah, it's a girl. Another girl? Yep. Oh, that's great. It's more good news for Tim's breeding program. And Chris names this girl Miley. Not a bad name. You've been injured. Oh. Miley. Wrecking ball. Yep, I'm sharp. Hey. Hello. Yep. With the microchip in place, it's time to round up Miley's mum. Come on, Meg. Down this way. But Meg's not budging. Can you make a little koala call? Eh. I'll give anything a go. And mimicking the sound that a joey makes when it's calling out to its mum, it surely can't be that hard. Eh. Come on, Meg. Eh. <laughs> Come on, Meg. Eh. What surprises me most is the fact that Tim is actually impressed with this. What surprises me even more is the fact that it works. Away we go. Well, I've seen some things, but I've got to pay that. <laughs> the koala call. The koala call was brilliant. <laughs> it's a gift. And there's one more Joey, and it's also a girl. We got a name? I think so. What do you got? One of those new age names. What is it? So it's not Teresa, it's Teresa. <laughs> After the trees, but not spelt that way, with an apostrophe. R E E S A H. Yeah? Fancy. Ah, good girl. Here we go. Okay. Overall, this was great. Three little girls, healthy little girls, all now identified. My kind of day. There we go. Come on. You can do it. I'm bleeding. Scratched, red raw, which is thank a typical you. day here. Yeah, so yeah. thank you. Good on you. Thanks, mate. See you later. <laughs> See you, mate. Thank you. Can't wait to hear his kids' names.